Well, I'm going to share with you something today. How many ready for the word? Amen. Um, I want to I want to share something out of Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one, and I'm reading this out of the Amplified. And here's what it says. It says, therefore, since we have this ministry, just as we have received mercy from God. How many know you received mercy from God? Uh, you know, when he, when, when he goes in and implies the blood on the mercy seat, that's for you and for me. You know, when you are guilty, and, and you know, when a, man, when a man's guilty and he stands in front of the court and the judge asks him to stand, he, he may ask, Judge, before sentencing, would you just have mercy? And that's what, that's what God did with you and I. Because we were supposed to pay the penalty of sin, and that was death. But when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, have mercy. And God extended that mercy to you and I because Jesus paid that penalty. So just as we have received mercy from God, granting us salvation, opportunities, and blessings, we do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation. Everybody shout motivation. motivation. So I want to talk to you just today a little bit about motivation. I think that sometimes we can hit a season or a state in our lives where something has like taken the wind out of our sail and we can lose our motivation. Motivation with serving God, motivation with coming to church, motivation with serving, motivation with uh, keeping our marriage strong, motivation with raising our children, motivation with going to work, motivation with running a business. But whatever it might be, sometimes you can lose your motivation. So I want to talk to you. I'm going to give you five things today that are motivators in the lives of human beings. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and we just honor you and we just glorify you for this morning. Beautiful day outside, a beautiful day inside. And we're so grateful, Father, that you woke us this morning and started us on our way. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. And we're so thankful right now to be in the congregation of other believers of like precious faith to hear the word of God that not only renews our thinking, but transforms our hearts, changes our lives. So I pray that a spirit of energy and motivation would just take over this room. I pray that right now in the name of Jesus. Let all who agree with that prayer this morning shout amen. amen. Hey, high five three or four people around you and just tell them motivation, motivation, motivation. Say it with some motivation. give you a definition here this morning. Um, put 35 minutes on there for Kenny. Let me give you a definition of motivation. If you'd like to take notes or write this down. A motivation is the process that initiates, it guides, and maintains goal-oriented behaviors. Here's what I like. It is what causes you to act. Motivation. Let me say it again. It is the process that initiates, that guides, and maintains goal-oriented behaviors. It is what causes you to act. And I don't know if you've thought about it. I don't know if you've pondered it. I don't know if you've sat back and, and, and considered what are the things that motivate you. How are you motivated? What are your motivators? 
And again, I'm going to give you five things, and I believe one of them or a number of them may apply to all of us in the room. The first one I want you to write down, number one, is pain is a motivator. How I many you know that to be true? <laughs> yeah, buddy. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried to the Lord because of my, y'all see that? What does it say? What does it say? I can't hear y'all. What does it say? My affliction. And he answered me. The word affliction simply means pain and suffering. So God told Jonah, he gave Jonah a command to go to Nineveh and Jonah was disobedient and he goes to Tarshish and then God prepares a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah's in the belly of this fish for three days. Jonah's starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable. (laughs) Can you imagine? In other words, the Bible says that Jonah prayed out of the fish's belly, out of the fish, unto God because of his pain. That's what I'm telling you. God's word itself didn't motivate Jonah to go to Nineveh. It was pain. They said, you know what, let me ship up. Let me get my ship together. Oh, I almost slipped up. No, one time I did a message, one time I did a message on membership and stewardship and friendship and relationship and leadership and partnership. And I just called it, get your ship together. Yeah. No, look at the person next to you. Say, get your ship together. Tell them, get your, get your ship together. Now, if you've only been saved two weeks, if you've only been saved two weeks, take your time. Take your time. <laughs> Many people in the Bible were motivated to reach out to Jesus because of their pain. We, we, we understand this, right? Uh, the two blind men. They came to Jesus and said, Son of David, have mercy on us. They reached out to Jesus because of their pain. I'm thinking about uh, the centurion soldier. He said, come, I have a servant at home, the sick. He reached out to Jesus because of his pain. J. Iris, he said, my daughter is at home sick. Come, Jesus. He reached out to Jesus because of his pain pain. I'm thinking about uh, the Syrophoenician woman. She said, my daughter is being grievously vexed with the devil. She reached out to Jesus because of her pain. I'm thinking about the paralytic man. The four people brought him to the house and let him down through the roof to bring him. They reached out because of his pain. I'm thinking about the woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I can just get to him and touch the hem of his garment. She reached out to Jesus because of her pain. The problem with kind of prompting is that once he heals your pain, what happens to your motivation? So pain can be a motivator, but it ought to be basement level. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The 10 spies taught us this, or the 10 lepers, I'm sorry, taught us this, because 10 of them were motivated out of their pain. They come to Jesus and say, heal us of our leprosy. He heals them of their leprosy, and nine of them are no longer motivated to come to Jesus. Only one turns around and falls at his feet and begins to worship him. Because for the nine, pain was the motivator. Some people's only motivation to reach out to Jesus is their pain. Some people's only motivation to come to church is their pain. Mm Mm-hmm. But how about the fact that he has a plan for you? 
How about the fact that he wants to produce something in you? How about the fact that he wants to prosper you and your children? How about the fact that he wants a personal relationship with you? So I'm saying pain cannot be our only motivator. But for some it is. There are some people who I know, I've been doing this a long time, and there are some people who I know when, they, when I see their face in church, I know it's because of pain in their life. And they'll come to church for two months and God will get rid of the pain. God will fix the pain. And then I won't see them for two years. Because the only thing that motivates them to even consider God is their pain. So I'm saying pain is a motivator. I, I remember listening to someone, uh, I can't remember who it was, but you've probably heard it during sports when you know they would interview like a star player who maybe lost in the playoffs the previous year and now he's doing good this year and he's winning the playoffs and they ask him, man, what is your motivation? How is it that you did this? How did you get over the hump? And you know what they say oftentimes? They say that that, that gut-wrenching feeling of losing last year did not want to feel that again. The pain of losing became his motivation because pain is a motivator. I've seen people who won't go to the dentist until their tooth starts hurting. Never mind the fact that their breath has been bad for months. They're developing halitosis. They have gum disease. But none of that was a motivator until that bad boy started throbbing. And then I got to go see a dentist. I've seen people who won't do anything different until death happens in the family. Mama died. Big mama died. And now you say, oh, from the pain I got to do something different. Big Mama would have loved to see you do something different while she was alive. I'm just saying pain is a motivator. This is a great thing to write down. Until the pain of remaining the same gets worse than the pain to change, you'll never change until the pain of remaining the same gets worse than the pain to change you'll never change I'm going to talk a little bit about change with our leaders this afternoon later but here's the interesting thing someone said no pain no gain and oftentimes change comes with pain it just does. Uh, growing pains because you're changing. You understand? And what I'm saying is it was painful for Jonah to be in the fish in this belly's in this fish's belly. It was painful. And until the pain of remaining the same, until the pain of just remaining in this fish's belly gets worse then the pain that it takes to change, you'll never change. Everybody say pain is a motivator. Is, a motivator. is that good? Yes. Write this one down. Number two, power is a motivator. In Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. This dude was motivated by power. Simon, you know what he was? He was a sorcerer. Sorcerer, sorcery, sorcery, sorcery. It comes from a Greek word, pharmaceutical, where we get pharmaceutical. All drug dealers is nothing but modern age sorcerers. 
peddling drugs that bring about the altering of minds. That's what sorcery is. And so Simon was used to operating in some sources of power because that's what he was motivated by. And so one day he sees Paul the apostle lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Ghost and power came on them. And this dude started pulling out money, saying, man, how much? I want that. I want to be able to do that because he was motivated by power. I wonder who's in the room. I wonder who's watching me online right now who's motivated by power. John told us, it's a brother in the scripture named Diatrophes, said he loved the preeminence among the brethren. I, I see it in church. I've seen it over the years, pastor, that there be some people who get close to me and then there'll be others who want to be closer than them. Because they're motivated by power. They, they think that the closer they can get to me, the more power they can have. And so they want the preeminence. In other words, they want to be treated more preferably than the other brethren. Simply because they're motivated by power. There was a woman who brought her two sons to Jesus. She said, can one sit on the right and one sit on the left? Because she was motivated by power. Are y'all following what I'm saying here? Power is an interesting thing, but it is a motivator. And we see Simon, this sorcerer, you know, he says, I want some of that. He said, so that I may have this power also. You know, Satan tried to use power to motivate Jesus. He took him up to a high mountain. It says, if you bow down to me and worship me, I'd give you all the kingdoms of the world. What he didn't know is that Jesus isn't motivated by power. What he didn't know is that Jesus says, all power has been given unto me. What he didn't know is that Jesus said, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of my God. So they're already mine. What he didn't know is that Jesus was motivated by saving souls. Jesus was motivated by sacrificing his life. Listen to this. Jesus was motivated by serving others. See, he said, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. In other words, he's trying to show them the proper way to power. Can I share something with you? That submission, this is my belief, submission, which is a beautiful word, but it's the result of sin. There would be no submission if there were no sin. The only reason submission came about is because Adam and Eve sinned. You and I are created as kings, priests, queens in the earth that we're supposed to rule. We're supposed to have authority and rule and reign everywhere we go. You weren't supposed to submit, you're supposed to rule. You're supposed to reign. But because of sin, God then put in this process, this process for us to get back to authority. And he said the way to do that is by submission. Now you have to yield. Now you have to surrender. Now you have to show God it's not about you, but it's about him. Now you have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time, he will are you hearing this? So I'm saying people are motivated by power, but most people don't know how to have power with God. Come on, isn't this good? So I'm just saying this is what this is what Jesus was motivated by serving. He said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Can y'all see the difference? 
See, most politicians are motivated by power. Not all, most. At least say some policemen are motivated by power. Not all, but some. Some physicians are motivated by power. They have what's called a God complex. They think that they're the healer. And so as a result, you can walk in many of their offices and they have no good bedside manner, bedside manners because they think they hold all the keys to the power. Mm-hmm. Some parents are motivated by power. Some pastors are motivated by power. Pimps. Come on. Rapists. They say for a rapist, it's not even about the sex. It's about power. Everybody is grappling for power. Everybody in this room under the sound of my voice and watching me online wants power. You might as well fess up to it right now. I already know it. The question is, by what means are you going to achieve it? I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen right now. Are y'all hearing this? And so I'm saying that power, listen to this because I don't want to, it's not bad in itself. Healthy power has to be harnessed. Uh, am I right? Like these lights all are on here, that, that comes from power. But they're being fed through electricity, through conduits that can control it and harness that power. You know, when you plug your cell phone up in a wall, that's, that's harnessed power. If you go outside and the line has broken, fallen down and split in half and land in the middle of the street, how many you know? That, that's not good. That's uncontrolled, untamed, unharnessed power. So that's what I'm trying to get you to see. Power is harnessed through humility. Boy, I just said something right there. See, 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 see. Power and pride <laughs> is going to be a big problem. That's how we should say that. Power and pride equals big problem. The Bible says pride, a haughty look, God hates it. Pride goeth before a fall. My mother-in-law used to tell me, son, if you see a man walking in pride, just put your ear to the ground. It's only a matter of time, he going down. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so, and so humility becomes the harness for the power that God gives us. And the more humble you are, the more power you can have. See, some people see kindness as weakness. Some people see meekness as weakness. Some people see humility as being sissy and soft. Uh, but can I suggest to you, it don't take a whole lot of power to cuss you out. It takes a whole lot of power to keep from cussing. See, see that, that's, now you flow it in power. Come on, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Power. Shout power is a motivator. Isn't that good? Write number three down. Passion is a motivator. Proverbs 16, 26 says, Life motivation comes from the deep longings of the heart and the passion to see them fulfilled urges you onward. It's the passion translation. Life motivation, it comes from, from wanting to see the passions that you have fulfilled. Now remember, motivation is what causes you to act. Remember? So you have to locate where your passions lie. 
What are you passionate about? I can share a number of things, but one of the things I can share with you still at 60 years old today, I'm still passionate about ministry. Someone said, when, someone asked me, when am I retired? I ain't even thinking about it. I still got so much passion. I have passion to see a soul saved. I have passion to see a life changed. I have passion to see marriages mended. I have passion, man, to see a teenager say, yes, I want to serve God. I have passion to see people come together and want to do something great to build God's great church. I still got passion for ministry. Notice I didn't say money. Because money, too, is a motivator. It's just not a very good one. There are many people in the room right now who are motivated by money. And so you work three jobs. And you get all the overtime that you can. And every job you go to, you hate it. And the reason you go to a job that you hate is because you're motivated by money. But what you have to do is quit being motivated by money and start finding out what's your passion. Because when you're motivated by money, you watch the clock. But when you're motivated by passion, you need more time. Y'all follow what I'm saying? And so, and I'm just saying, money is a motivator, but it's just not a very good one. Let me read something to you. Uh, Forbes magazine put an article out about how money is not the best motivator. It said most successful entrepreneurs say that their primary motivation has been to build something lasting, not to make a lot of money. If you go and read the stories of these guys, you know, this, this, this Tesla guy and uh, Gates and all these guys, they, 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 they wanted to build something that was lasting. And just in the process of fulfilling their passion, you, you understand? They, they made a lot of money. Now, <laughs> I don't want to offend nobody with this. But this is why a bunch of stimulus checks aren't good. I know you can't wait. You going to the mailbox. Did I get my stimulus check? Printing free money. It's not good. COVID should have taught us this. Because what it creates is a lazy, lethargic society that lacks motivation. I can't tell you the employers that I have talked to who told me that they can't hardly get people to come to work. <laughs> because a lack of motivation. Free money is not a motivator. Stimulus checks are not a motivator. Welfare is not a motivator. Locating where your passion lies is the motivator. Somebody say amen. Amen. Isn't this good? And let me just say this. If you are lazy, if you are lethargic, if you are lukewarm when it comes to your relationship with God, if you lack go-getter, maybe it's because you're not surrounding yourself with the right people. Everybody say passion. David was a great example of this. David was passionate, man. D David was passionate about war. You know, everybody else is scared and hiding from Goliath. 
I don't know where my clock went, Kenny. I don't, there's no clock on it at all. I don't know where my time is at. But uh, David said, why are y'all hiding from this joker? He said, he's an uncircumcised Philistine. David said, let me at him. David took his slingshot, picked up five smooth stones, only had to use one. He just, he just, he, he was masterful with his skill at, at, at war and fighting. So much so, Saul said, here, take my arm. And David said, no, I ain't proving this. I don't know if this works. I do know what this, I know what this can do. And, and David, the Bible said David ran toward him. You, you know, that had to startle this big dude. Like, what is this dude about to do? He's running. Everybody else is running away from Goliath. David is running toward Goliath with his slingshot because he's passionate about war. He cuts off Goliath's head. He said, I'll feed his carcasses to the fowls of the air that everybody will know there's a God in Israel. David goes out and he kills 200 Philistines and cuts off their foreskin and brings them to the feet of his king Saul. Man, David is passionate about war. David kills Bathsheba, has Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed out on the battle. He's just passionate about war. And, and, and having said that, he's passionate about women. <laughs> Because he sees Bathsheba one day on the roof taking a bath. He says, mm hmm. Gots to have me some of her. <laughs> Call for her to come over to the palace. Y'all know the story. He's passionate about worship. It was David when King Saul would be tormented with evil spirits, and David began to play, place anointed, gifted music that would exercise the demons out of Saul's life. It was David who would lay out in the field with the sheep and begin to sing, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want and he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It was David who danced out of his clothes because he was so passionate about worship when the Ark of the Covenant got back into the city of David and his own wife began to ridicule him but he didn't care because he was passionate about worship. Are there any people in the room who are passionate about worshiping God? Uh, no, 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 no. Are there any people in the room who says, I don't care if you think I look like a fool, because, but you ain't the one who saved me. You're not the one who delivered me. You're not the one who healed me. You're not the one who set me free. You're not the one who picked me up, put my foot on a solid ground. You're not the one. So I am going to worship whether you like it or not. I'm passionate about worshiping God. That means we shouldn't have to pump you to worship, prime you to worship, pinch you to worship, press you to worship, push you to worship, not in areas that you're passionate about. Because passion all by itself is a motivator. Hey, glory to God. Yeah, I got ahead of myself. Write this one down. People are motivators. We said pain is a motivator, power is a motivator, passion is a motivator. How many of you know people are motivators? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 16 and 10. It says a good leader motivates, doesn't mislead, and doesn't exploit. You, you, you see that? Good leaders are motivators. Don't mislead, don't exploit. My job is to motivate. Let me use another word. My job is to influence you, not to impress you. Too many leaders want to impress people. But my job is not to impress is to influence. Let me give you a quick example of what I mean when I say this. And I'm not throwing off on any other churches that do this. But we don't take up two, three, four, five offerings in a service. We take one. Because my job is to teach you the importance and your responsibility as a Christian as giving and tithing. 
if we take up the one offering and hope that you participate in it. We don't have to take up another offering and then another offering because the ushers got in the back and counted and it wasn't enough. And so they said, no, go back to the people again. Some churches do this. Some churches would do things like uh, the $50 line, the $100 line. Oh, God's really speaking to the $1,000 line. That's misleading. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? I get it when you're in the moment with a gifted communicator, a prophet, an evangelist, or someone who knows how to use the gift for the gap, it could feel like it's motivating. But it's misleading. Are you hearing me? So I'm saying this is a good leader. Motivates. So what I'm saying is you have to be motivated. My job as the people, as the person in your life, is to give you God's word, and hopefully God's word will motivate you to do what is right as it relates to you being a Christian. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, people are motivators. People are motivators. Yeah, maybe your eighth grade teacher was your motivator. Maybe your music teacher was your motivator. You understand? I remember we first laid eyes on JB. JB came to our 20th or 25th, 20th, it had to be our 20th anniversary that was held over in Gehanna. What's the name of that place? Over in the Gehanna where we had our 20th anniversary. Jefferson Country Club. And JB was sitting there with a bunch of students from, from uh, Fort Hayes in, in their band. And the teacher brought the band over, and they were our music for the, for the evening. And JB sat over there with them and playing the music. I'm just saying, maybe that was his motivator. Sure, sure. You understand? Yes. I'm saying, maybe your high school coach was your motivator. Maybe your physical trainer is your motivator. Maybe your pastors are your motivator. Maybe having a child was your motivator. You know how you was just running wild and doing what you wanted to do and just going wherever you wanted to go and shaking it up in the nightclub and then you brought this little life into the world and you look into their little eyes and they look back at you and you say, oh, now I'm responsible not just for me, now I'm responsible for them. I got to ship up. I got to get myself together. I got to do something different than what I've been doing because people are motivated. I see men, I see men was at a four and got a good woman. Now they're at an eight. Oh, that's this old man just oh that boy needs a good woman <laughs> to motivate him are you hearing me I seen men get divorced because they stayed at a four as soon as they got divorced they went to an eight start getting good haircuts grooming up putting on their clothes because they wanted a new person people are a motivator but if they would have did all that when they was married they probably never got divorced. Yeah. Are y'all hearing this? Yeah. Here's how I jumped ahead of myself. I was thinking two thoughts at one time. Now, let me get to my point. If you're lazy, if you're lethargic, if you're lukewarm, if you like go-getter, then it's probably because you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people. Because people are motivators. i never forget early on when I was pastoring, I would get with pastors in the city. Six, seven pastors, we always meet for breakfast in the city. And we sit out at breakfast, we sit around the table, and I listen to their conversation. And all they talked about is how the church was horrible. All they talked about how the people won't do nothing. How they can't get people to serve. How they can't get people to give. Oh, it's just the people, the people, the people, the people, the people. And I realized, that's not the crowd for me. I probably wouldn't be here today if I stuck with that crowd. Because many of them aren't pastoring today. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. People are motivators. 
You ever seen the movie Matilda? Who's seen Matilda? I need some Matildas in my life. I need some Matildas to say, you can do it, Brucey. You can do it. I need some Jennies to say, run, Forrest, run. I need some Dr. Seusses to say, all the places you'll go. I need some Kobe Lees to say, you are amazing. You are amazing. Y'all know who Kobe Lee is? Y'all don't know Cody Lee. He's on America's Got Talent. And he's artistic and he's blind. And he's an amazing musician. And we went to Vegas a few months ago and we went to America's Got Talent show and Cody Lee was there. And he would always say, you are amazing. You guys are amazing. Can't see. You guys are amazing. That's his word. I want to be around some people like that. I want some Cody Lees in my life. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> Everybody shout, people are motivators. Here's my last one. Pleasing God is a motivator. Pleasing God is a motivator. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men to please God. The Bible says we'll come up on a time and living in a day where, where men will become men pleasers. Pleasers of men rather than pleasers of God. Let me give you four things and I'm going to be done. Pleasing God invokes his presence. Pleasing God invokes his presence. You know, you know, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. I, I wish I could go to the scripture. I don't have time. There's a scripture in the New Testament, I believe it's in Corinthians, it says that we ought to praise God. And it goes on to say, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He loves when you praise him. There's something about it that pleases God. It says he inhabits, he, he draws nigh, he comes near, he comes close to him, he just sets up camp his presence in places that will praise him. So I'm saying when you please God, it invokes his presence and the way you can please God is by praising him. That's why he says, enter into the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Pleasing God, write this one down, invokes his peace. The Bible says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I'm just talking about peace over your life when you please the Lord. How many of you value peace? No, 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 no. I'm saying how many of you are done with the shenanigans and the drama and you know what a scripture I haven't read but I hear the Holy Spirit bringing it to mind. I haven't read it in a long time. But the scripture says that the king desires conditions of peace. That's why scripture says things like prosperity and peace shall be within thy walls and thy palace. Peace. I don't know if there's anything more valuable other than healing than peace, man. Amen. Peace with no money. Come on, absolutely. Absolutely. Come on. This is 
is why the Bible says, Scripture, he addeth no sorrow. The Lord maketh rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. When I was in the streets, I was hustling and bustling for money. The Bible says that the wicked run and ain't nobody chasing. Who after me? Ain't nobody after you. You just ain't got no peace. But when you get the peace of God, pleasing God invokes his peace. Put my next one up there. Pleasing God invokes his promises. Wow, isn't that true? The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. And he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. There's just something about stepping out on that limb of faith and saying, God, I just believe that you are. I quit asking questions long ago, where'd you come from? I quit asking questions, how did you get here? How did things get? I quit asking that long ago. When I come to you, I just believe that he is. And it doesn't stop there. And that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So he's saying that when you operate in faith, it pleases God and promises rewards come as a result of your pleasing God. Hallelujah. Is that good? My last one. Pleasing God invokes his power. His power. I think I have a scripture, maybe. Oh, yeah. Think about this. The Bible says, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. But he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I read that and I begin to think. How much did Enoch please God where he was able to escape this last enemy called death? That's the last enemy who Jesus was put under his feet is death. But the Bible says that Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God and he pleased God in such a way that he walked with God and God took him, translating him that he should not see death. I'm saying that's power. That's power. Are you hearing this? So you and I, we express that power, the power of God, with our mouth. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of tongue. Isn't that what it says? Jesus modeled this power for us when Jesus one day walked by a fig tree and cursed it at the roots. Said, you should not bear any fruit anymore. Jesus modeled this when he stood in front of a tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus modeled this when he stood up on the boat one day and said to the winds and the sea, peace, be still. And then he tells you and I, have faith in God. Whosoever.
shall speak to this mountain. That's what we sung about. Shall be moved. And you should not doubt in your heart, but you got faith. You don't doubting in your heart. He says, whatever you say if, shall come to pass. That's power. I don't know what your mountain is this morning, but you got to start exercising your faith and speaking to your mountain. Maybe it's a money mountain. Speak to the mountain. Maybe it's a marriage mountain. Speak to the mountain. Maybe it's a mental issue mountain. Speak to the mountain. Maybe it's a ministry mountain. Speak to the mountain. 